camera changes. They should start right away with the intro. This part is absolutely subjective and a personal complaint of mine, but Ron Perlman shouldn't have been dropped as a narrator for no good reason. He's been the intro narrator since the very beginning of Fallout. It's almost like a tradition at this point. Even Fallout 3, despite its many countless glaring issues, stuck to this tradition. Now I understand he won't be able to narrate the Fallout intros forever, but they still had him voice a character in the game. It's not like he was unavailable, or too expensive, or anything of the sort. They had him record lines for the game anyways. This would almost be like having a mainline Star Wars movie without the iconic intro music. There is a more impactful issue on the game itself here, though, and that's the fact that it's a character doing the narration of the intro. Specifically, the playable male character, Nate. War never changes. Right off the bat, this decimates a huge portion of the player's ability to roleplay in their roleplaying game, and this will get far worse by the end of the introductory segment. The second he begins speaking, it puts an inflection on the character you play as if you decide to play the male character. It gives tone and personality to who he is without letting the player have a choice through the use of a silent protagonist as in the previous games. The blank slate silent protagonist is incredibly useful for some games, RPGs in particular, because it allows you to either project yourself onto the character you play as, or it allows you to craft your own backstory for your character, and you can play as that character you made with your own rules defined for your character. The silent protagonist even allows you to imagine what your character sounds like. You cannot play this way in Fallout 4 because the game establishes who your character is for you and voices every single f***ing thing they say. And I am afraid. For myself. For my wife. For my infant son. Because if my time in the army taught me one thing, It's that war... War never changes. The issue impacts both characters heavily, but it's more severe with Nate than it is for Nora, just because he gets the intro narration as well. During the intro, he talks about his family history, how his great-great-grandfather fought in World War II. He talks about his personal history, that he served in the military as well, he fears for his family's safety. Before you even have a chance to do anything in the game, the character of Nate is, for the most part, written in stone, and you can't change any aspect of it. He's a veteran soldier who cares about his family, he's married and has a child. As for Nora, you can learn about her backstory shortly after. She's a law school graduate, and regardless of which character you pick to play, they swear vengeance for their murdered spouse, and they swear to find their kidnapped child. Your ability to decide who your character is has been almost completely destroyed, and this continues throughout the game as your character is voiced. For a point of reference, both Fallout 1 and 2 were also a bit limited in terms of what backstory you could write for your character, but there was still enough room to work with. The only established parts of your backstory were that you're a vault dweller who has been chosen to find a water chip in Fallout 1, and that you're a tribal descendant of that vault dweller in Fallout 2. After that was a huge step down in Fallout 3, where most aspects of your life were decided for you during the opening of that game. You know who your bullies are, you know who your best friend is, you know who your father is, and you know your mother is dead, and you're 19 years old by the time you leave the vault. There's still a bit of wiggle room to establish a personality at least, and through the karma system, you could choose to be good, evil, or neutral. New Vegas did this best. All that's established about you in the base game is that you're working as a courier at the time you get shot. Everything else is up for you to decide. None of that exists here in Fallout 4. The worst part is, they didn't even use their established character effectively. 
There's two basic kinds of playable characters you can make. Some games can diverge from this, but the basic two are the Blank Slate and the established written character. As I mentioned, the Blank Slate is great for player projection or for role-playing as a character the player writes themselves. The established written character is better for a more focused story or narrative or character-driven games, like Grand Theft Auto, God of War, The Witcher, Soma, Legend of Dragoon, and so forth. The thing about these games is that having these characters established allows the writers to work with them to push the story forwards. The characters react to events or are put in situations they have to deal with, how they act and react, the choices the character makes influences how the story progresses, even if that story plays out the exact same way for the player each and every time. Who the characters are and how they act are integral to the stories being presented. Fallout 4 obliterates the player's ability to create their character for the sake of establishing who the protagonists are, but then proceeds to do absolutely f***ing nothing with them after the early parts of the game. Nate's history as a soldier, or Nora's history as a law school graduate, should influence their interactions and decisions. Who they are before the war should have an impact on who they are when you play them. But that does not happen. The difference between playing Nate and Nora seems to be entirely cosmetic. After the intro and early segments of the game, for all intents and purposes your character is a blank slate, even though the player's ability to do anything with a blank slate has been destroyed. In fact, Nate and Nora are essentially the same person, with most dialogue responses being exactly the same word for word. So they don't even offer unique interactions with characters when you play through the game. Now the real reason for this is because the writers don't want to write two versions to everything the protagonist said. But it does go a long way to making both characters feel less like the individuals Bethesda was trying to establish in the opening, and more like an all-purpose jack-of-all-trades player character that could fill any role the player wants them to. As a result, what we end up with is a worst-of-both-world situation where a blank slate can't be utilized by the player, and where the established character isn't utilized by the writers. Worse yet, if you decide to play as Nora, then there's a bit of a disconnect from the intro narration now as well. Rather than being the words of the person you're going to be playing as, it ends up being the words of someone who ends up being just some guy to the player. It's a character within the world, but one that dies five minutes into the game, and you have no reason to personally care about. During the intro narration, Nate describes how he fears for his family, and his fears are soon realized when Kellogg comes into the vault, murders his wife, and kidnaps his child. But if you're playing as Nora, Nate doesn't get to see his fears realized. He gets killed, his kid is taken, and his wife, who has no established combat or survival experience, is left to fend for herself in the post-apocalypse world. As a result, it has less impact. And this becomes even more weird when Bethesda seems to be trying to tell a personal story as both the intro and ending cutscenes are told from the perspective of the character rather than the impact they had on the world. But if you play as Nora, then it's a personal story that opens with Nate's intro narration and ends with Nora's outro narration. And I am afraid. For myself. For my wife. For my infant son. I can feel it wash over me. The heat. The force. The radiation. The fear. It's the end of the world all over again. A neutral narration is important in this situation because the narration exists solely to inform the player of the background details and history of the world, and it's kept separate from any characters because if the narrator is a character, everything they say is likely through a filter of their own biases or perspective, and in this case in particular, it establishes too much of the character we might play as. The neutral narration voice tells you the history. A non-player character presents your goals and gives the urgency to the situation, and you are presented with a canvas on which to build your character. Fallout 4's intro failed the moment you hear the voice because it either builds up a character that ruins any chance for you to build your own backstory, 
or it builds up a character that the player doesn't have time to get invested in and dies five minutes into the game and is never seen again. The worst part is that they do just enough to ruin the player's ability to create their own character, but they don't do anything with it. It's just all this unnecessary information about these characters that's just there for some reason. I could have even overlooked pre-established characters if they were done really well. The connection between the player and Nate and Nora is vastly different from the connection between Nate and Nora themselves. The player has only known them for about five minutes when your spouse dies, as opposed to knowing each other for many years. This works for a game driven by an established character. You don't need a connection to Max Payne's wife or child to understand why he seeks revenge and how that drives the story and character. But here we're thrust into a role that we fill as the player, and they don't do enough to make the player invested in either of these characters when you're not playing as them. Your character's spouse is someone we spend all of five minutes with, then they die. Your character cares when they die, but the player typically doesn't have the attachment necessary for this to be as impactful as it should be. As a result, your character's spouse ends up as nothing more than a footnote on the overall game, and they feel entirely disconnected from the rest of the game. Just to make it clear, since this may seem like I'm arguing out of both sides of my mouth here, I criticize the fact that it exists at all in a game series all about choice in creating your character, and now I'm criticizing it for not even doing the established character well. If they were going to scrap the blank slate for the sake of doing an established character, they should have done it well, not this half-assed middle-of-the-road garbage. As I said, it's the worst of both worlds. I'll talk more about your lack of ability to decide who your character is later when I talk about the dialogue system the voice protagonist, and the lack of a karma system. With the opening out of the way, and considering how negative most of this will be, I suppose I should say something positive. Visually, the opening cutscene looks great, and I actually think it's a really interesting idea to start a Fallout game before the war, so we could get a glimpse into the world before it became the wasteland we all know now. Having only seen the burned out remains and ruins of what once was, being able to see at least a portion of that world beforehand was actually pretty nice. The narrative of being a pre-war citizen could also be really interesting and having to either adapt to, or embrace, the morality of the post-apocalyptic wasteland, but I don't believe Bethesda handled either of these things well in the slightest. There's a slight hint to it alluded to in the main story, and that's the most we get out of it. Inside your pre-war home, you have the ability to interact with objects all around your house, and your character will comment on them. But most of your character's lines sound forced and unrealistic. It ends up feeling like your character is in a commercial. Seriously, no one talks like this. The Braxo for all your cleaning needs. Another fine product of General Atomics International. New Coca-Cola. Ice cold. Saddle up Salisbury steak. Rated A+. Mmm, mmm, I sure do love me some brand name Oreos. There's also a jab at the criticisms of Fallout 3 having everyone surviving off of 200 year old pre-war food. Instamash, fancy lad snack cakes, Blamco mac and cheese. Expires in... never. Besides that, you don't get to experience much of this pre-war world. You're hard locked into this house until you have to flee for the vault, and even then you can't go anywhere but towards the vault. Naturally, I don't expect the developers to model an entire pre-war game world, that would be insane. But considering they went so far as to start this game before the bombs dropped and give us a small taste of what the world was like before the nuclear apocalypse, it would have been nice to see just a bit more of it than this little house in one street. Additionally, everything about this presentation of the world seems a little too perfect. You live in a perfect little neighborhood in your perfect little house with your significant other and child. Everything is beautiful and there's not a care in the world, la dee da I sure hope nothing bad happens on today, October 23rd, 2077. It feels like the most lazy and blatantly obvious gut punch they could have made. Many players would know that this is the day the bombs were dropped, and even people new to the series would know that this is a post-apocalypse game so we all know this isn't going to last. It makes the pre-war world feel too idyllic, to the point of it feeling like a cartoon or a parody. 
It's like in a bad TV show where a background character is suddenly given a backstory and gets a lot of camera time because they're going to die in this episode, and we need to fast track the audience into caring about this person's death. Fallout 4 treats its pre-war world just like this. There's hardly a hint of the world being as bad as described. It's like we're looking at a slice of some other world here, as compared to the intro, which was so grim as to show children fighting in a street littered with rubble. Things are so desperate that people are charging towards a power plant as if they think they could just loot energy and take it home. There's currently a massive war going on, and the country is falling apart. Nate himself fought in the war. But nah, forget all that. Look how peaceful and perfect everything is in Sanctuary Hills. Listen, after breakfast, I was thinking we could head to the park for a bit. Weather should hold up. Let's get pumpkins instead. Carve jack-o'-lanterns. Your characters talk about going to the park as if there isn't a care in the world. It ends up feeling like narrative whiplash. It'd be like watching an action scene in The Terminator and hard-cutting to an episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. These two things don't fit together unless done as a joke. Now, I don't expect to see riots outside of your house, but it really does harm the experience when the tone of the intro cinematic and the tone of the opening segment of the game clash so harshly. It's hard to take the game seriously when the opening cinematic presents a grim world on the verge of destruction, but the first playable area of the game makes it feel like you're playing a caricature in a dopey cartoon world. Your perfect life is suddenly interrupted by a salesman who couldn't have had more convenient timing if he tried. Despite these games being about choice, Bethesda apparently doesn't care about that in the slightest. At best, they'll pay lip service to choice, and at absolute worst, they just ignore your choice. You cannot, under any circumstances, tell this guy to go away. Go. Away. If you keep refusing, your character's spouse will step in and try to convince you, and if you further decline, they will say they'll just fill out the forms for you, which still opens the character creation menu for you anyways. So this begs the question. Why give me the choice of declining if I don't actually have a choice here? If the game is just going to force this upon me, regardless of what I decide. This ends up being very well representative of the overall game, where there is little choice and quest objectives will be updated for you as if you said yes. Now I understand that you need to be approved to enter the vault, but the problem is this could have been handled in so many different ways that would have worked better. Seriously, just about anything would have been better than this. You could have the confirmation papers on a table. You check them over to ensure all the info is correct, which opens the menu to change your special one name. It performs the same function without the contrivance of having the absurdly immediately convenient timing of signing up for the vault an entire three minutes before the bombs drop. Golly gee whiz, that sure is lucky. Seriously, why can't you tell this guy to fuck off? Even if it's a simple choice, the player should have the option to tell him no. Then when you hear the newscast talking about the bombs dropping, your character could go, Oh shit, maybe we should try the vault anyways. And the representative is there with the checklist and allows you in, as your spot was pre-approved and not given to anyone else. Maybe even at the cost of another family being denied, who they were considering letting in due to the sudden free space. A little bit of a consequence of taking away a family's last chance of survival for your own. I mean, for f**k's sake, the act of signing up for the vault and actually getting there are only a couple minutes apart. It's not like the paperwork was processed by vault tech in that short span of time. After we get rid of the vault tech representative, we're directed to go spend time with this plot device. The entire first half of the game is about trying to find your child, and they needed you to be invested in him, so there will be some urgency to the situation when he's kidnapped. And apparently they thought this 30 seconds of interaction with a near inanimate object would be enough. Then you're called into the living room by your robot. The worst has happened. The nukes are dropping. Our front door magically opens on its own and we're urged to run to the vault. That's really the only option. Other directions are dead ends or result in bombs dropping, killing you instantly. Upon reaching the gate, we see the vault tech representative as he tries to get through to the vault, but he's threatened and runs away. I sure hope he wasn't so concerned over his own life that he forgot to give them our paperwork. Oh wait, it's fine. Why was he not already in the vault with his information? 
It seems as though there would be very little time for him to have reached the vault and done the necessary paperwork to allow you entry. And this just seems entirely arbitrary on the part of the game. An alternate way to handle it would be for the guard to say your names aren't on the list, and the vault tech rep, standing beside him, lets him know that you were just approved and lets you in. Up the hill is a large platform elevator, the only one of its kind in the series to date as a vault entrance. Now this was obviously done purely so you could see the nuke go off in the distance and have a tense moment as the shockwave approaches, as it's slowly lowering you down. But this entire moment is a style over substance issue. First of all, that close to a nuke, you're likely to be permanently blinded as a direct result of looking at it. Just because some people might be unaware, a nuke going off is incredibly bright. There are instances of people in the real world being a bit too close to nuke tests, where the light is so bright that they try to block it out with their arms, only for their arms to appear translucent due to the sheer brightness of the explosion. Sorry to say, but everyone on that platform is mega fucked. The other main issue is that gamma radiation travels at the speed of light, meaning everyone on that platform also got a nice big dose of radiation. Let's ignore the obvious implications of that, though. I'm sure it won't impact the main story in any way, shape, or form. The best part of the opening of this game is the introduction to the vault itself. More of a winner by default, but they actually handle the vault tech employees quite well here. There's something a bit off about them, and they give the impression that you shouldn't trust them without it being too absurd and blatant. They're just as creepy and uncanny as vault tech employees should be, which is genuinely one of the few strengths of this intro. You and your family are led into a room with what you're led to believe are decontamination chambers, but in reality they're cryogenic pods. You're frozen for an indeterminate amount of time, but are defrosted to see two people at your spouse's cryopod, one in this protective, almost hazmat-looking getup, and the other looking like a thug. They try to take your babby from your spouse who resists and gets shot and killed by the thug. Revolvers don't eject the bullet casing after being fired. How do you ah! f*** up something so basic? If the parents are so important that you'd specifically be referred to as the backup, then why would they handle things so clumsily as to kill one of the parents? More so, why do they think you'd be willing to comply if they did need you for some reason after killing your spouse and kidnapping your child? This whole scenario gets a whole lot worse later on. But really, there's plenty of options for dealing with the situation available to these people. There's plenty of unused vault suits in the vault itself. It would have been trivial to put one on, wear a lab coat over top of it, claim to be a doctor and say they need to check on the baby. Hell, why not just take both parents and the baby? Probably because that would make too much sense. You're refrozen and are defrosted again an indeterminate amount of time later. Should you interact with your spouse's pod, your character will swear vengeance and promise to find your kidnapped babby. Glad to see my ability to roleplay as someone who doesn't give a shit ah! is being well respected. If you look around a bit, you soon find out that everyone else in your vault is dead for some reason. Keep that in mind for later, I'm not done with it yet. The vault itself is a fairly short but otherwise standard tutorial dungeon, with useful starting equipment and basic enemies. Skeletons of the Vault Tech employees are scattered about the place, showing us the vault has been sealed for a very long time. Upon reaching the exit elevator, you're given a last chance to change any important details about your character, which is to say, your name, appearance, and special. Though you can't change your character's sex, for some reason, likely tied to the fact that player control is swapped between two models during character creation at the start of the game, and since one of those characters is dead now, you can't really swap to it. Of particular note, you didn't get to pick your tag skills, because there is no skill system in this game. Don't worry, we'll be covering that later. Much later. After you confirm your character, the elevator takes you up to the surface. You have the option to pretty much go wherever you feel at this point. However, I'll be focusing on the first half of the main story for now, and this is very likely to be the first steps anyone would take on their first playthrough.
You return to your home in Sanctuary Hills and find your robot is somehow still active, even though he needs fuel. He informs you that it's been 210 years since the bombs dropped. He asks you where your spouse and child are, but he refuses to accept what you've got to say and absolutely insists on searching the town for them. If only Sir were here to help, where is he by the by? They... They killed him. Oh, Mum, these things you're saying, these terrible things, I, I believe you'll need a distraction. Yes, a distraction to calm this, this dire mood. It's been ages since we've had a proper family activity. Checkers, or, or perhaps charades. Oh, Sean does so love that game. <laughs> is, is the lad uh, with you? Sean's been kidnapped. And I'm gonna find him. I'm gonna get my baby back. It's worse than I thought. You're suffering from hunger-induced paranoia. Not eating properly for 200 years will do that, I'm afraid. <laughs> 200 years? What? Are you sure? A bit over 210, actually, Mum. Give or take a little for the Earth's rotation and some minor dings to the old chronometer. <laughs> That means you're, uh, two centuries late for dinner! <laughs> Perhaps I can whip you up a snack, if you must be famished. What? No. I need help, Codsworth, not food. Mom, I've been thinking. If something is amiss, your loved ones may simply be hiding from the Red Menace. Codsworth, I don't think the Reds are going to be a problem anymore. I have an idea. Let's search the neighborhood together. After all, Sir and young Sean, they're, they're my family too. There's nothing left here. It's all gone. Well, if you wish to venture to parts unknown, I won't stop you. I shall guard the neighborhood in your absence. This is very arbitrary and obnoxious. We just saw the spouse die not five minutes ago, and some mysterious people run off with your child. There's exactly a 0% possibility that they're playing hide-and-seek in the ruins of your neighborhood. These robots should not be capable of sapient thought. That was supposed to be a unique trait of the Zax computers, which were so big you needed an entire facility to house them. Further, your robot blathering on about nothing and ignoring your orders would be incredibly inconvenient in an emergency, which means these consumer-grade robots would be more of a hindrance than helpful in dire situations. Now, you can just ignore them and go off on your own. However, if you're going into this blind, or just generally playing this for the first time and genuinely interested in the main story so far, then you're required to humor Codsworth with his wild goose chase of looking around the town for them. He absolutely refuses to give any further information or suggestions until you help him with his inane bull ah! Remember, this is your robot, not a sentient being. The fact that you can't just tell him to ah! fuck off and help you is ridiculous. After you kill a few bloat flies, Codsworth realizes that your spouse and child really are gone. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. He suggests you try searching Concord, though depending on his answer, he'll say they either shot at him, hit him with sticks, or that they may be heavily armed. Sean's out there, Codsworth. I need to find him. What about Concord, Mum? A few people there. And last I checked, they only pummeled me with sticks a few times before I had to run back home. Happy? This whole thing was a waste of time. I only wanted to help, Mum, but maybe you could try Concord. I've seen people in that area, and they're only slightly heavily armed. Thanks for trying, Codsworth. You can't give up, Mum. What about the city? Concord is nearby, and, well, the people there have only shot at me a few times. This results in a bit of an awkward moment, 
where he doesn't give you any kind of proper assessment of the threat at Concord, it can be assumed that all three scenarios are true. So if he says they hit him with sticks, why would he not inform you that they're heavily armed, or even that they shot at him? His suggestion of checking Concord is also a total shot in the dark, too. It's by pure happenstance that you just so happen to meet a friendly group there, on the other side of a group of raiders. Speaking of, that's our next destination. Upon approaching Concord, you hear gunshots in the town. It seems there are two groups in conflict. Oh boy, my first chance to pick sides! I'm sure the first NPC I meet could explain the situation to me, resulting in possible choices that result in... No. Actually, all the people outside the museum are hostile. Granted, they are raiders, but this still could have been an interesting way to introduce potential faction relations that are significant to the world and gameplay, but those things would need to exist in the first place to even be something they could introduce you to. No, what we're given here is what Fallout 4 gives us for pretty much the rest of the game, with rare exception, and that's a group of nameless enemies to demolish and zero nuance to the conflicts you deal with. Now something was attempted with the main factions, but the keyword is attempted. The main factions are a discussion for later though. For now, without knowing literally anything about the situation, we just jump into the fray and eliminate everyone outside of the museum. Hey, what if this town is full of settlers trying to rebuild? And what if Preston's group were actually a group of raiders that had been cornered? Man, that would sure be awkward considering you just jumped in and started killing without being informed of the situation. Sure is lucky that everyone you mindlessly killed just so happened to be raiders. I mean, sure, they can shoot at you first, which is absolutely justification for retaliation. It just comes across as weird that this conflict is so shallow especially since there's no chance to join the raiders as well. Anyways, once everyone's dead, a man named Preston Garvey asks for our help and directs us to pick up a... laser... musket. Ugh, more on that later. Inside the building, the group of survivors is locked in a room on the top floor. You cut through the raiders to reach them. Despite most of the fighting force having just been eliminated, they still think the threat is significant enough to warrant getting an old suit of pre-war power armor fired up for combat. Yep, just 20 minutes into the game and you're gifted a free set of power armor, complete with minigun. This is where the extent of the choice in this game is perfectly highlighted. You have the option to say no, and your quest log updates anyways telling you to go get the power armor, as if you had said yes. This is crazy. Just... Hear me out. Get the suit. You can rip the minigun right off the vertibird. Do that, and those raiders get an express ticket to hell. You dig? It's a suicide mission. Look, new gal. Don't know what cave you're from? Don't care. But you need to shake off the cobwebs and smell the cordite. Or we're all dead anyway. So here's the deal. That armor's out of juice. Probably has been for a hundred years. It can be powered up again, but we're a bit stuck. The answer's no. I'm out. Just like that, huh? You come this far then condemn these poor people to die? All right. Have it your way. Stay safe. Maybe at least one of us will survive this. That's amazing. It's like a ah! telltale game. That's how little the developers respect your choices in this game. The fact they'll give you a choice, but all choices lead to the exact same outcome, thereby making your choice entirely pointless and irrelevant in every possible way. The dialogue from NPCs reacting to your unwillingness to help them is nothing more than flavor text. And all of this is in a game series that has historically been about the player's choice in handling situations and conflicts. It's also never explained why you have to do this. They constantly act like it's your responsibility. But why can't anyone else in Preston's crew do this? Sure, Mama Murphy is useless, but Preston could do it. Why does he not step up to the call to action? Because ah! f*** you, that's why. It's absurd they'd condemn you for not risking your life to help them when there's able-bodied people here who won't step up for themselves. Now you can just walk away. 
But the result is Preston's group and the raiders go into stasis until you return, if you decide to return. There's never a bad outcome for abandoning them in their time of need. They're never wiped out by the raiders, because these characters are too important to die. So everyone in Concord just kind of goes to sleep as backup, in case you lock yourself out of the other three factions. I know I'm really railing on about this point, but it's important to talk about in relation to this being a Fallout game. Some people are going to think this is nitpicking, just play the game, forehead! But some people might need reminding that this is a game series about choice, and the first significant choice you're likely to come upon isn't a choice at all. Worse yet, if you want to be a pacifist, then good f***ing luck, because this game has got nothing for you. It seems Bethesda was so impressed by their shooting mechanics that id made for them, that they centered the entire game around combat, with a little to no choice to do no harm, or even do as little harm as possible. Bethesda had such a relentless murder boner, that they made the first significant section of gameplay literally all about killing people indiscriminately, then they give you better gear to do it more brutally and effectively, culminating in a fight with a death claw. Typically, it's not a great idea to give the player super powerful equipment early on. It makes that equipment far less special and rewarding later on. Because you didn't have to work for it or earn it, it's just given to you. And it makes the early game a face roll. It devalues power armor as a whole, and it's no longer an achievement to acquire it. To compare to previous games, in Fallout 1 you had to join the Brotherhood, and either earn a set by doing a quest where you have to deal with several difficult enemies, or you had to be skilled enough to repair an older set yourself. And even joining the Brotherhood required doing a literal suicide mission and surviving. In Fallout 2, you didn't get the power armor until you reached Navarro, which most players aren't going to know about on the first time through. Even during the development of Fallout 3, Bethesda had the good sense to lock power armor behind a perk, requiring training for use, as you could find power armor very early on. To give an example from another game series, even ah! Pokemon had a system from the very beginning to prevent players from just being given super powerful Pokemon in a trade to breeze past the entire game. Traded Pokemon would only follow your commands if you had the badges that cover that level range. Level 100 Pokemon would only follow commands from someone who has the 8th Gym Badge, for example. This is also why legendary Pokemon are typically reserved for late or post-game encounters. They're supposed to be rare and unique. Handing one to the player 20 minutes into the game would make them being a legendary entirely meaningless. It's very much a similar situation with power armor, something that's typically very rare and sought after, it's just sitting there, waiting for people to take it, and this is far from the only instance. The entire world is littered with sets of power armor just sitting out in the open, and in the entire span of 210 years, no one decided to use or repair these sets of armor, for just no reason. In Fallout 4, it seems they were so obsessed with the rule of cool and spectacle over substance that they just hand you a set of power armor 20 minutes in and make you fight one of the most notorious creatures in the series, thus devaluing Death Claws as an enemy at the same time. Enemies that were once notorious for their durability and high damage output are now turned to pace by your hail of minigun fire before you've completed the first real quest of the entire game. 
This ends up being underwhelming and turns Death Claws into a f***ing ah! joke. Part of the reason the Enclave and Fallout 2 are so intimidating was due to how powerful they were. Even if you turbocharged your character in the post-game and had advanced power armor Mark II, it was still very difficult fighting their soldiers on Navarro. You don't kill one of them with ease in the first 20 minutes of the game, because that would be stupid. With all that out of the way, we return to Preston and his merry band of chuckle ah! Upon explaining your situation to him, Mama Murphy begins to plague us with her existence. You'd need to stay strong like you've been, because there's more to your destiny. I've seen it, and I know your pain. Taking a page out of Mr. Caption's book here, Mama Murphy is a total contradiction for the series. Psychers are incredibly rare within the Fallout universe, with only a few in each game to date, and their powers were varied, yet consistent. In Fallout 1, the Master had a few Psychers, whose abilities were varied including manipulating flame and telepathy. Most of them were insane and suffering due to their powers, though these powers were lessened by the use of psychic nullifiers. In Fallout 2, the village elder, Hakunin, as well as the super mutant boss, Melchior, are both Psychers, the former contacting you in your dreams, and the latter spawning and controlling enemies out of goo. Fallout 3 apparently had a couple too, but I'm so sick of that game I don't even want to look it up. For the sake of simplicity, I'll just assume they were there. New Vegas had a kid simply named The Forecaster, who could give vague visions of the future. Though use of his ability caused him headaches, so he used a psychic nullifier to reduce these effects. The one through line between all of these characters is that their powers didn't just arbitrarily turn off due to a lack of a resource. In fact, their powers couldn't be turned off at all. The best you got was essentially limiting them through the use of psychic nullifiers. Mama Murphy is the exception to this. She gets visions of the future as a result of taking drugs, and that's the only time her powers work. They go away entirely if she's not taking drugs. Keep in mind, it isn't one specific drug she uses over and over again. They're essentially random drugs. Sure, the order she requests them in is the same every time, but the point is that it's no one single drug that causes her visions. It's all of them, as she feels a craving for them. It's already stupid that her powers completely vanish due to the lack of a resource, but this is made worse by that resource being entirely random. Brain chemistry is a complex thing. It seems a tad bit f***ing absurd that random drugs would result in the activation of a specific ability with no rhyme or reason. Because these drugs are going to affect your mind in different ways. Hell, one of them is called Psycho and drives you into a rage. Rather than using mostly fictional drugs, let's replace them with real drugs as a hypothetical. So Mama Murphy gets her visions based on a random craving for... Weed. Meth. Heroin, cocaine, LSD, and shrooms. Most of these drugs have wildly different effects upon people, yet for Mama Murphy, I guess they just all happen to activate her powers because they're classified as drugs. See how cartoonishly ridiculous this is? Anyways, she gives vague information to you about your kidnapped son. He's still alive, but she doesn't know where he is. She then says she doesn't even need her powers to tell you the best place to start looking is in Diamond City. I repeat, the main quest of the game directs you to a psychic who tells you she doesn't need her powers to tell you where to go next. Amazing. Now you can find a book that will mark the location on your map, though it's hidden in a basement and many players are likely to miss it. For this book to be useful, it basically requires stumbling upon this location at complete random and actually exploring this location before helping Preston and his merry band of ah! wits. Alternatively, Trashcan Carla will give vague directions and not even mark the location on your map. And even then, you can't bring up your missing babby or anything of the sort. But the main way most people find out about Diamond City the first time through the game is by getting it from the psychic who didn't need her ah! powers to tell you it's the best place to start looking. The only good thing about Mama Murphy is the fact that you can kill the bitch by giving her too many drugs. Are you kidding me? What are we going to do without the sight? She knows about it? You mean she had one of her visions while she was stoned out of her gourd. 
And now you want us to just head out on another wild goose chase based on no better plan than Mama Murphy saw it? God, I hate Preston's entire crew. They're just extremely basic character traits and nothing else. And they're all obnoxious. Mama Murphy is the mystical weirdo. Preston Garvey is the guy who only wants to help everyone, but he's too pathetic to do anything and spams you by asking you to help another settlement. Marcy is a permanently angry, obnoxious bitch all the time. Sure, let me just stop what I'm doing to talk to you. I'm being sarcastic. Leave me alone. June is in a perpetual state of sadness to the point it seems as though the developers modeled his face to always look sad. And Sturgis is the generic cool tech dude. After rescuing Preston and his merry band of dip ah! they move in the sanctuary and squat in your former neighborhood without your permission. Keep in mind, some players might have already started building their bases in the town by this point, and they just move in regardless of your wishes. However, if you miss it the first time through, this is likely to be your first introduction to the settlement building mechanics. Preston's group of rejects will require beds and so forth, so the game pushes you to use the system. However, this is where we abandon Preston and his group of brain-dead assholes for a significant chunk of the game. Hope they fucking die. Because we're continuing on with the main story, to Diamond City, the great brown jewel of the wasteland. Upon reaching the city, we come across one of Bethesda's Kodak moments. They're these scripted events that often feel forced, awkward, and clumsily implemented, with Piper here being a pretty good example. She's standing outside the gate. Upon approaching, she starts yelling into the intercom, demanding to be let in. However, if you don't approach, but see her there from afar, she's just standing there, loitering, with nothing to do, and not a care in the world, despite the fact that Diamond City Security is currently in a massive firefight with super mutants just around the corner. She's essentially in stasis until you arrive, which is unfortunately a common theme with Bethesda's games. Part of the issue is due to the open world nature of the game, and Bethesda just not knowing how to implement these events more organically. Because of the clumsy implementation, these events end up being a detriment to the overall world, rather than helping it, which is what they should be doing. It ends up making the world feel so much more artificial as a result. Anyways, she's demanding to be led into the city, with the guard refusing her due to his orders. Upon noticing the player, Piper then lies, claiming you're a trader out of Quincy with enough supplies to keep the general store stocked for a whole month. Keep that in mind for later. This convinces him to open the door, and the mayor is just kind of standing there, like a creepy fucking robot, just waiting for her, even though he should have heard the guard talking to her on the intercom. What was his plan exactly? He's pissed at her because she wrote an article accusing him of being a synth, so he locked her out. Was he hoping that she'd just go away and not return to her home, business, and, most importantly of all, her sister? Was he hoping she'd die? Pretty sure that would reflect badly on his character to the other residents of the city, locking someone out to die because they did something he doesn't like. Worse yet, there's the battle I mentioned between city security forces and super mutants. Will have the tide of battle turn for the worse, and they have to retreat back into the city. Well, I guess they're ah! out of luck because the mayor's too focused on his petty grudge against Piper and trying to get her killed that their security force is locked out of town too. If the goal is to paint him as incompetent and selfish, that's one thing, but that doesn't really come across through the rest of the game. The mayor is a bit player at absolute best, and the only time he's relevant to anything is buying a house, doing a particular radiant quest for the Institute, and the only post-game quest in which he wants to escape the town with his life after the Institute is destroyed. It just seems like it wasn't thought out all that well. It probably would have been more effective to arrive at Diamond City to find Piper and the mayor yelling at each other in the street. Maybe he's threatening to shut her business down or something. It would get the same point across without him looking like an incompetent sociopath by trying to get someone indirectly killed and putting his own security forces at risk as a direct result and further, potentially restricting trade into town. What's even worse, is that the game confirms this is a regular occurrence, which means that the mayor has been trying to get her killed for a while now, as this has happened numerous times. But this further adds the issue that she leaves town regularly, 
Knowing he's trying to get her killed, Danny has been ordered to lock her out numerous times before, but he always lets her back in. Sometimes she even has to trick him in order to get back in, as she did this time. This compounds the issue even further, as it implies the city regularly locks its only entrance, meaning any possible travelers, and especially traders, could be kept out of the city, and anyone who wants to leave would be trapped. If you don't take her as a companion, she remains a Diamond City forever, with absolutely no reason to leave. This is a regular issue with modern Bethesda titles, where situations just exist for the sake of the writers getting the scenes they want, with no lore or world building to support it, and in the off chance they do add some lore, it turns out the opposite is true, in which the lore and world building they add to these scenarios make them even worse if you think about it a little more than not at all. The only thing Piper seems to do is write her paper. She doesn't do any other work to survive, and has no reason to leave the safety of the city, and yet, she does so anyways. Regularly. She's supposedly a journalist, but she doesn't actually do any journalism. She just rants about the Institute. With the gate open, Piper and the mayor get into it over her newspaper. Though this does turn a bit awkward and Piper has to get into her scripted position in order to respond to him, resulting in a long, awkward gap between the lines. Piper, who let you back inside? I told Sullivan to keep that gate shut. You devious, rabble-rousing slanderer. The level of dishonesty in that paper of yours. I'll have that printer scrapped for parts. That a statement, Mr. McDonough? Tyrant Mayor shuts down the press. This conversation highlights quite nicely how simplistic and shallow the writing for this game is, too. The mayor immediately complains, demanding who let her in, and how he demanded Sullivan to keep the door closed. As mentioned, the guy who opened the gate is several feet away from the mayor. There's literally no way for him to not know what just happened. This already turns the situation into a farce as is common with modern Bethesda. Piper drags you into their argument, asking if you care about her newspaper. Your response is entirely irrelevant, as they all lead to the exact same response. The mayor is saying he didn't want you dragged into the discussion, and saying you seem like Diamond City material. After a little more back and forth, the mayor asks what brought you to the city. You could choose to tell him you're looking for your missing baby. Piper initially seems concerned, but the opportunistic bitch immediately uses it against the mayor. I'm trying to find someone. Trying to find someone? Who? My baby boy, Sean. He's less than a year old. Wait, your son's missing? You hear that, McDonough? Is Diamond City Security just gonna stand by while a mother searches for her infant son all on her own? No, don't listen to her, well... I'm afraid that our security team can't follow every case that comes through. I'm confident that you can find help here. Diamond City has every conceivable service known to man. One of our great citizens can surely find the time to help you. A mayor of a great city must know everyone. Who can help me? Well, uh, there is uh, one private citizen. Nick Valentine, a detective of sorts who specializes in tracking people down usually for debts or whatnot. No, I have to get going. I'm sorry Diamond City Security doesn't have time to help, but I'm sure Mr. Valentine charges a reasonable fee. This is ridiculous. Diamond City Security can't spare one officer to help. I want the truth, McDonough. What's the real reason security never investigates any kidnappings? I've had enough of this, Piper. Uh, this isn't a mercenary group. It's a security force for the town. Are they supposed to send their men out to potentially die over every person who comes to town with a problem that needs solving? You don't even know where to look, let alone what kind of threats you're facing. What if it was the gunners who kidnapped your baby? Is a lone Diamond City security officer supposed to take on a group with military training? This just makes Piper look like a total idiot. It's completely unreasonable that Diamond City should sacrifice one of its security officers to help this total Randy who just walked up and has literally no connection to anyone in the wasteland, let alone the city. Especially as these security officers are likely to be citizens of the town with their own lives and families, and not a mercenary group that's been hired. 
What's worse is they don't even seem to consider the possibility that it's a trap of some kind, by raiders or other groups. They just trust 100% without question that you're looking for your lost Babby. But I guess we're just supposed to take Piper as being right, because she's good, and the mayor is wrong because he's evil. Any basic amount of critical thinking on this conversation makes it fall apart. The mayor says security can't help with every case that comes through, which is nothing less than totally reasonable. And he says he's sure you can find help within the city, rather than just simply pointing you to Nick Valentine, literally the only detective in town. Worse than that, the game gives you a persuasion check for this. If you fail, the mayor cuts the conversation and says he doesn't have time for questions. If you succeed, he tells you to ask Nick for help. I don't get why this needs to be a special check. It's not like revealing the town has a detective who specializes in missing cases is going to compromise his synth status. It just comes across as totally arbitrary. Piper again presses him about why he won't spare a security officer to help, and she seems like she's acting like this is a big conspiracy, demanding the truth and all that. She really comes across as unlikable in this conversation, due to her insistence on something that is completely unreasonable. After the mayor walks off, Piper says she needs to get settled back in and asks you to stop by later, because she's interested in writing an article on you. Yeah, gee, thanks Piper. Glad to see you care so much about my missing kid, when it's convenient for you to give the mayor shit and immediately forget about him afterwards. And after that, she just walks off. Keep in mind, Piper knows Nick Valentine, and she just won't give you the information after you just ask for help in finding your missing child. She's willing to bitch and moan at the mayor for not sparing a guard for any kind of help, but she doesn't even offer up the extremely basic information that a detective lives in town that you could ask for help. This is made worse by the fact she not only knows he exists, but she's literally friends with him. Oh, and if you try to talk to her as she's walking away, she just kind of waves you off. Hey, Piper. We'll talk more once I get settled in. Hey, I gotta inside. check a few things first. We'll talk later. We'll talk more once I get settled in. Self-centered bitch. So if you didn't hear about Nick from the mayor, which most people won't, and because Piper won't tell you, you're left to just ask around. Some NPCs will tell you nothing. Some will point you towards Valentine's detective agency. They don't have anything of note to say about the man otherwise. No key details or vital information about him that might potentially be important to dealing with him, given the broader context of the world we're in. Just that he's a detective. Even so, it's not hard to find his office. It's got a literal neon sign lighting it up. Glad to see the custom neon sign business is thriving in the post-apocalypse, when the rest of the world's business has crumbled for obvious reasons. Upon reaching the office, you find his despondent secretary, who initially tries to wave you away, but pressing the matter results in her revealing that the detective is missing, in which you respond that you can find him for her. You can respond that it's not your problem, but you literally can't progress without Nick. He's required for the main story. So at this point in the game, the story is essentially to find a missing person, so you can find a missing person. See, people go missing all the time in the Commonwealth. It's established fairly early on, and it's even brought up in the conversation between Piper and the Mayor. It's understandable that some people might get tired and jaded from all the disappearances, but it's a bit ridiculous that you can only ever ask Nick for help. It's not like there's a giant mercenary faction with military training in the region who could potentially be hired, but that would require better writing. Maybe I don't want to take my chances on finding a guy who gets himself lost to help me find my kid. But this game is intent on railroading you as much as humanly possible, so we have no choice. Nick should be easy to spot. He's always wearing that old hat and trench coat getup. Hat and trench coat getup, eh? I wonder if there's any other distinguishing features that could be useful to find him. I gotta stress how dumb this is. It's sad that this needs to be explained, but clothes can be changed. If for some reason Nick changed clothes, there goes all the information on his appearance that we have. Now this is all in preservation of an awful twist, 
but she completely fails to mention that Nick is a synth for literally no reason. You don't even know you're looking for a robot man, even though that should be a big f***ing deal. Keep in mind, it's very possible to encounter hostile synths prior to this point in the story, and it's possible to learn what most people think of them this early on, too. Ellie takes no notes of your vault suit, and, if you're not wearing it, you could easily be assumed to be a rando wastelander. So narratively, it's possible that Nora could have the same opinion of synths as everyone else, that they're dangerous and should be killed. That, combined with Ellie not giving you this key information, turns her into a brain-dead ah! f***ing idiot. For all she knows, the player might run into Nick and accidentally kill him, assuming he's just a regular synth, same as any other. Worse yet, what if he's already dead? Nate would have no way of knowing if it's actually him or not. With how torn up his body is, it's a reasonable assumption that the Triggerman might have used a random synth as target practice, maybe dressed it up in Nick's clothes to mock him, or even having killed him and put the clothes on their target dummy. Now, of course, that's not what actually happens, but the point of what I'm getting at is her leaving out key information could have had dire consequences, as she has no possible idea how Nora is going to react to a synth in a world where everyone hates synths. You fight some bozos lurping as the Old World Mafia, and make your way through an unfinished vault to find Nick. By the way, what a shocking twist, he's a synth. How you doing in there, Valentine? Feeling hungry? Want a snack? Wait, why is this guy taunting a robot about being hungry? This is beyond f***ing ridiculous. Bethesda, what the f*** are you doing? The writers went out of their way to have a character taunt a robot about being hungry. Was this to preserve the twist for just a few seconds longer? Even though there's no reason to suspect Nick of being a synth at this point? Again, this nicely highlights the issues with the writing. They think you're that much of an idiot, that they're having a character spout lines to another character that make absolutely no sense at all when given the full context. It shows no actual care was put into making things consistent at all. It's just a bunch of shit haphazardly slapped together and hoping it'll coalesce into a coherent narrative. Which it never does, unfortunately. You rescue Nick and explain the situation. He agrees to help you once he wraps up business here. You can't exit the way you came, because the dungeon forces you to jump down a hole to proceed. This is done to prevent you from just backtracking, because they've got a story to tell, and by god are they gonna tell it no matter how ah! it is. After fighting through more generic goons, Nick unlocks a door that conveniently loops us all the way back around to the start, where we encounter Skinny Malone. He's just standing outside waiting for us. As if he knew whatever had slaughtered his men would be something that could be confronted and talked to. What if it was an army of synths? Or super mutants? He'd be pretty ah! now, wouldn't he? Did he read the scripts? To find out it would just be the player and Nick? Maybe he should have read a bit further to see what happens to him. Now the game tries to imply there's more to him, including a bit of a history between him and Nick, through dialogue. But the reality is that this is a one and done baddie. You can either kill him and his goons, or pass a speech check, in which he allows you to leave. Should he survive, he goes on to do exactly nothing of significance or importance, thereby making the decision to spare him entirely meaningless. In fact, sometimes he never even leaves this spot. He'll just stand here, doing nothing, forever. Oh yeah, Nick was on this case to save this girl. Similarly, you could talk her into going home, or you could just kill her. Nick doesn't seem too concerned about her death, though. Almost like this was another meaningless choice. Having escaped the dungeon, Nick says we'll talk back in Diamond City. We sit down and explain the details of the case. The most important detail that gives Nick the breakthrough is that a man involved was bald and had a scar on his face. Man, it sure is lucky that absolutely no one else in the wasteland is bald with a scar. Oh, uh, well. That's a bit awkward now, isn't it? Seriously, bald and scarred seems like it would be a common descriptor, especially in the post-apocalypse, where many people would be earning scars in their day-to-day -day survival. However, luckily for us, this is all Nick needed. He says Kellogg has a house in the abandoned east stands of the city. 
Why would any part of this city be abandoned? You'd think people would want to live in such a secure location. Regardless, this section only has two buildings. One that literally has no entrance, and Kellogg's house. Making the abandoned East Stands even more of a joke than Whiterun's Cloud District. However, I want to highlight a bigger issue here, and that's the fact you can't just ask about the man who kidnapped your son at all when you first arrive at Diamond City. Just think, the only information you have at this point is that a bald man with a scar took your son, and that bald man with a scar just so happens to live in the city you've been directed to, and you can't ask anyone about him. You're instead forced to go find a detective, who then tells you the man you're looking for lives in the city you've already visited. It gets even worse than that, however, as Nick's secretary Ellie has a case file on Kellogg for... some reason. Hell, if I know why they have a case file on him, but provides literally no other information than to confirm this basic description of him. But this also means we didn't even need to find Nick for this. She could have found the information herself. Inside Kellogg's house, you find a button that opens up a secret door to a secret room, which makes absolutely no sense at all. Diamond City doesn't have any kind of contraband. Weapons, ammo, and chems are sold freely in the market with no limit or restriction. The sole reason this seems to exist is to hide the necessary quest item from being found before it's supposed to. There's other ways for this to have been done that would have made a little bit more sense, but ultimately, Kellogg's secret room is a minor point. The bigger issue is what the game is about to force onto you. Having found nothing of significance in Kellogg's house, Nick puts out a call to Dogmeat if you don't already have him with you. It seems Bethesda really had an axe to grind with players having any kind of choice in this game, and the choice to not deal with Dogmeat at all is cut off at the knees here, as you have no other option but to interact with him for this quest. We're several quests deep into the main story now with no significant choices. In fact, a little spoiler for you, but the only significant choice in the entire main story is what faction you join. That's it. Anyways, the story actually changes if you don't encounter Dogmeat prior to this point. Nick knows him instead, and now we're following Kellogg's trail thanks to the dog. There's several rest points where Kellogg either took a break on his journey, or he encountered and killed people. Strangely, one of these encounters seems to be an entirely benign caravan, which he just... wiped out. Hilariously, the robot will say, He... killed... us in such a way as to try and make it sound horrifying, but just comes across as comical due to how sh** this game is. System corrupt. I can't feel my legs. What happened here? Error. Operator deceased. Threat level Omega. He... killed... us. It's worth pointing out, too, that Kellogg skipped town a few weeks ago. Remember, he left town before Nick did, and Nick was missing for at least two weeks. How is all of this evidence perfectly intact and not disturbed at all? You're telling me it didn't rain, or there were no rad storms in that time that could have ah! up the scent for dog meat? The blood didn't get washed away? No scavengers, human or otherwise, disturbed these rest spots? As it turns out, Kellogg has been squatting in Fort Hagen for the past several weeks, rather than actually doing anything. He does have a mission to go on, but I guess that's not so important. Fort Hagen is just a dungeon full of generic synth enemies, with Kellogg as a boss at the end. He spends the majority of the dungeon taunting you and trying to convince you to turn around, but once you reach the end, he's willing to talk with you. Like many other encounters in this game, it's entirely meaningless. There's no possible way to talk Kellogg down under any circumstances, and there's absolutely no information to be gained from him at all. Essentially, it seems as though this conversation exists, because the writers thought you should talk to the antagonist before killing him. Because the previous games did that, while missing the significance of those conversations. He can mention the fact that Sean is older than you expect, which seems a bit obvious considering you're a refrozen. However, I'd like to stop for a moment to go on a quick tangent about naming, because the wrong name can easily turn a character into a joke. I cannot take Kellogg seriously when he has the name of a cereal brand. It's f***ing silly. I don't know if he was intentionally named after Serial or if it was a coincidence, but something they should have reconsidered. Kellogg being named what he is? 
makes me take him just as seriously as if he were named Snuffleupagus. Anyways, with Kellogg dead, we randomly loot a piece of his brain for some reason. I'm sure it won't be significant later. It sure is a good thing we managed to kill him without destroying his head. Er, uh, well, at least that part of the brain survived, I guess. Upon looting the corpse, your character states that Kellogg was more machine than man, and there's a couple of random mechanical parts that could be looted. We're apparently at another dead end, though, so you regroup in Diamond City with Nick and Piper for some reason, and this leads into a conversation in which Nick gets the idea to dive into Kellogg's mind, though to do so, we'd need a piece of his brain. It sure is a good thing Nora looted a piece of Kellogg's brain for no discernible reason, or else the Radroaches might have eaten it by now. We go over to the memory den, and any moral implications about what we're about to do are basically hand-waved. Nick can't explore the memories himself, so it requires both of us to plug into it. In fact, it's really lucky Nick is with us, because Institute Tech is fairly unique, so it works with Nick. Now obviously, the best way to handle story in an open-world RPG all about choice is to forcibly shove the player into a 20 minute long corridor as exposition gets vomited at you through Kellogg's memories. It's just an overly long set piece where we're given entirely useless information about Kellogg's history. I guess at some point the writers realized their main antagonist for the first half of the game was paper thin, so they decided to slap all the important information about him into a set piece after he died. We learn he had an abusive father, got a girlfriend and a child who were later killed by a mysterious group. He then wandered and became a cold-hearted mercenary, then showed up to the Institute looking for work. I just want to stop a moment on this section of the memory because my ah! god is this lame. He takes out the three robots with extreme ease to show how skilled he is, but it comes across as really f***ing lame when the robots arbitrarily move this sluggishly. Seriously, this feels like a joke. They move so slow that you'd have to be a crippled old man for them to genuinely be a danger to you. Also, just to backtrack slightly, the fact Kellogg lost his girlfriend and child is almost a parallel to the sole survivor. It almost seems like that was intentionally done. But there's no connective tissue at all. It just shows up after Kellogg is dead. And that's the end of it. As overused as the trope is at this point, there isn't even an attempt at a we're not so different, you and I, scenario. I suppose the expected implication here is that you could very well be going down the same path as Kellogg, losing your morals along the way for the sake of vengeance, and becoming the monster you viewed Kellogg as from the moment you saw him threatening your family. Yet, none of this is explored at all. No one cautions you about your actions if you are falling from the path of morality, and no one commends you on sticking true to doing the right thing. Your voiced character doesn't question their own actions either way, and there's nothing to check in the Pip-Boy regarding this at all. This is all because the game is on a rails. There's no real option to do good, or bad, or anything besides follow the rails we're locked to. There isn't even the karma system that Fallout 3 had, despite being a lazy downgrade from the more complex reputation system from Fallout 1 and 2. And Bethesda doesn't even get the excuse that they're from old games, because New Vegas did it too and Bethesda still didn't learn from it. Fallout 3's karma system alone is still better than nothing at all, and as a result, this attempted connection to Kellogg, as well as the implication that you're following in his footsteps, is ultimately meaningless. We kill an antagonist who gets his entire story thrown at us post-mortem in about 5-10 to 10 minutes and are expected to care or take something away from it. Just like the rest of this game, it's entirely hollow and does not carry the weight it should. It's the same lazy ah! shit writing a lot of entertainment media does, and throws a family onto a character to make you care about them more, and to anyone really paying attention, it falls flat like most other times it's done. Oh no, his father was mean to him as a kid. He had a family and lost him. He's suddenly a tragic character I feel emotionally connected to. It's an extremely cheap way to try and make the audience care when there's really no reason to. And when it's handled this way, these characters are basically props introduced at the last second to try and make you feel something. Unfortunately, this crap works on a lot of people. You could connect an audience with a properly developed character, but it's hard to have any real meaning and connect with a character 
with their generic bad guy man. Oh, but wait, now he has a tragic backstory. Isn't it sad? The next section of note is the kidnapping scene from the start of the game. And oh boy, does this start raising some significant issues. However, we can't talk about them quite yet. I'm saving them for later. So just keep a few of these little notes in mind. First of all, his mention of the old man, who I assume is the leader of the Institute. The other major thing to take note of is that everyone except for the player is intentionally killed. Kellogg did so under orders. Apparently they were loose ends or something. Actually, I can't talk about half that point right now. So how is leaving the parent of the child you kidnapped not a loose end, but all these random assholes are? We're talking about a bunch of pre-war softies here. They have literally no experience at all in surviving in the post-apocalypse. Day-to-day survival would be far more of an issue, especially since they wouldn't have any support from the vault. It wasn't equipped to prepare its residents for returning to the wasteland, so all they've got is what extremely limited tools are within the vault, and whatever they could scavenge after that. The Institute is an underground complex with plenty of synths for security, and literally no known surface access. These guys don't stand a chance of even finding the Institute, let alone making it inside, let alone being any kind of threat. Hell, the average Wastelander probably poses more of a threat to the Institute than these f***ing people do. Kellogg's assessment of the situation is completely accurate, too. The one person they didn't kill is the one person they gave a reason to hunt them down. This is even worse if you happen to be playing as Nate, as he has an established military history. Sure, he's not Liam Neeson in Taken, but he's got more experience than the average person would. There's never a reason given beyond the extremely arbitrary the old man wanted them dead because my loose ends. Even though this is actively counterproductive to his goals and the goals of the Institute as a whole. Gotta hold back here. Gotta save this for just a little longer. It'll be more impactful then. In the last segment of the memory sequence, we see Kellogg in his home in Diamond City with a 10-year-old Sean. We learn that Kellogg is hunting a scientist that escaped and is hiding out in the glowing sea. And we learn the Institute uses teleporters, which explains why no one has found their base of operations in all the time they've existed. So we've got our next lead. Upon exiting Kellogg's brain chunk, we reunite with Nick upstairs. Kellogg manages to get the last word in on us before fully fading from Nick. In other words, the game just established an entire plot point of Kellogg's consciousness surviving inside of Nick, as even Nick is unaware of what Kellogg said, only to drop it immediately. It seems to serve quite literally no purpose, and I guess it's just meant to be a spooky moment. Anyways, we now have to find Virgil in the glowing sea. The detonation site for a particularly toxic nuke, as the landscape is unlike any other we've seen in Fallout to date. Even the outside of Vault 87 in Fallout 3 looks like the rest of Fallout 3, despite being a direct hit from a nuke. Even Megaton doesn't equal a quarter of the devastation from this one bomb. If nothing else, it makes for a unique environment, however the area is heavily irradiated, meaning it is extremely dangerous to enter. Nick says he should have no problem, because he's a robot. Which actually is kind of a problem, because radiation is known to destroy electronics. I am willing to buy, however, that it simply works different in this universe. This leads into an entirely different issue, however. The Institute wants Virgil eliminated, but he specifically fled to the Glowing Sea to avoid pursuit which implies the Institute would be hesitant to send their coursers into the Glowing Sea, and they're hesitant to send their regular-ass robotic synths in as well. Keep in mind, these are literally synthetic humans. If the Institute can just straight-up create humans out of the resources they've got available, then why can't they modify them to resist radiation? Hell, even barring that, surely you could just give them some Radaway and Radex, right? Nope. Apparently that's just too much. As a result, Virgil remains in his little cave, free of harassment or attempted murder. You don't know exactly where he is, but there's a... settlement. Just out in the middle of the most dangerous part of the wasteland, inhabited by Cult of Adam followers. 
A progression of the ridiculous religion from Fallout 3. So after appropriately leaving a pile of charred corpses behind you for that inane stupidity... Virgil is a human turned super mutant. Amazingly, he's one of the extreme few that didn't go insane and turn hostile. Keep that in mind for later, I'm not done with it yet. He agrees to help you to get into the Institute, on the condition that you get his cure for him. His... Cure... For being a... Super... Mutant. <sighs> That's perfect timing for another tangent. It's ridiculous that being a super mutant can be cured. The level of mutation is insane, and to revert it back to complete normal just makes no sense in the slightest. It's like trying to unbake a cake and separate the ingredients to their original state before they were all mixed together. Fallout 1 does establish that a virus that reinfects a subject with their original DNA could reverse the effects, but there is no known way to remove the FEV itself. Now when I criticized this in the original video, people responded citing this lore from Fallout 1, but the problem is there's nothing in Fallout 4 to bridge the gap. Quite literally, any defense for this is simply saying that's possible due to Fallout 1's lore, while Fallout 4 completely fails to explain this in any way, shape, or form. He just has a cure, because reasons. Never mind the fact it's never explained in the slightest how he figured out this was the case. Considering how much Bethesda just retcons the lore at will, through the sheer effort of simply not giving a single solitary fuck, I cannot take this as them using the Fallout 1 lore without any evidence to support it. As far as Fallout 4 is concerned, Virgil just has a cure. End of story. Which has dire implications for super mutants as an entire race in this series. However, I have been leaving a tiny detail out. You see, in the original video, I speculated that Virgil could possibly make more of the cure, resulting in the potential extermination of the super mutant race through curing them all. People pushed back, specifically using the lore of Fallout 1, saying it required his DNA, so it would only have ever worked for him. Well, he actually has the lines in-game in which he says it will take years, maybe even decades, for him to generalize the formula. Virgil. Welcome back. It needs some refinement, but uh, I think we can consider my serum a qualified success. This is incredible. It is a significant first step, but it still only works on one strain of FEV. It will take years, perhaps decades, to generalize my formula. Still, you have my gratitude. Meaning, as a direct result, the game is implying that a super mutant cure is very likely to be a potential future plot point, as I speculated originally. Anytime I dig just a little bit deeper, I end up finding more and more issues, which seems like a very nice place to add in a side note. Virgil's terminal confirms to us that the dips living in the glowing sea are, in fact, immune to radiation. They just are. Because reasons. This is just low-effort garbage-tier writing to justify these stupid characters existing out here. Nothing more. Because if this line of text didn't exist, the them playing around in literal nuclear waste would just straight up be a plot hole because they should be dead. Anyways, Virgil tells us we need to acquire a Courser chip, and while we're off doing that, he's going to drop the blueprints for the teleporter. Just to remind everyone, Virgil is a biologist, and he's going to drop complex technical blueprints for a ah! teleporter. Getting the Courser chip is one of the more interesting quests on the first time around, simply due to the fact there's no map marker to lead you around by the nose. There's a frequency that increases in strength the closer you are to this Courser. It's very lucky one just so happens to be out and about on a job at the exact moment we need it. The building he's in is controlled by the Gunners, and this entire dungeon seems to be designed specifically to show off just how insanely powerful Coursers are supposed to be. It's like a Terminator is tearing through the entire population of the tower. Just as a quick reminder, the Gunners are a mercenary group with military level training, and a single Courser is absolutely shredding them. I'm sure that will be totally consistent later on. After killing the Courser, you get his chip and go to the memory den to get it decoded. Amari says she's unable to do it, but the railroad might be your best bet. 
In fact, it's your only bet. There's no way to progress without being railroaded into dealing with the railroad. One of the most stupid factions in the entire series, only outclassed by the Institute's sheer terrible writing and contradictions at nearly every stage. This is another quest in which you're meant to find your own way, but it's trivial at absolute best. There's literally a bright red line that leads directly to their secret hideout, and there's a puzzle to open a secret door into their secret base, which is also trivial, to the point of making the entire faction look like a ridiculous joke. The password to their super secret base is the name of their faction. When you're under threat of being wiped out by opposing groups, it might be a good idea to not have a bright red trail leading to your front doorstep and not have the password be the publicly available f***ing name of your faction. Even now, nearly eight years later, I find this mind-numbingly f***ing retreaded. Holy shit, this is so insanely stupid. This would be like if all the top secret company information at Microsoft was stored on a computer on which the password was Microsoft. There is no good reason in the slightest that their password should be so simplistic as to be their own name. To make matters worse, along the trail there's several metal plates with a number pointing at a letter on the plate spelling out the password. Christ, at this point you might as well just have a giant glowing neon sign announcing to the world that this is the secret railroad headquarters. This is made even worse by a line from Deacon. If you talk with Deacon after first arriving at the railroad, you can actually call out the password to which he dismisses. What? Normal people can't figure out your decoder ring out front? These days being able to even spell railroad is cause for celebration. This is absolutely pathetic. First of all, their biggest threat absolutely can spell railroad. Secondly, most people in the wasteland appear to be literate, even the raiders. All over the map, you'll find written notes as well as terminal logs that are all spelled correctly. In fact, as far as I can tell, this is the only instance of literacy even being brought up in the entire game, which in itself is a problem. Now, it does make sense that in the post-apocalypse, most people wouldn't be literate. However, the problem then becomes the fact that the world itself shows us the complete opposite. So the base assumption is that everyone or at least most people can read or write. Deacon's line tells us that barely anyone is illiterate, but it's only invented to excuse the shitty password, and is totally incongruent with the rest of the game. Honestly, they would've been better off if they hadn't tried to explain this away, because it just causes more problems. The reason this is such a big deal is that it makes the entire group look cartoonishly incompetent. It's like a joke from South Park, except it's done in earnest rather than being an actual joke. Due to the password being so simplistic, this puts the entire group at risk, because pretty much anyone could get inside now. Keep in mind too, that during the railroad quest line, they have you enter their former headquarters, which the Institute had raided and killed numerous railroad members. Upon opening the secret door, you enter into a dark room, only to have a light suddenly turn on, revealing the leader of the railroad and a few of her chuckle ah! friends. Do they just hang around in this room with the light off all day. It seems as though they wouldn't be progressing their goals very far if that's the case. Deacon walks in and vouches for you regardless of what you've done until this point, but this is largely because the game completely disallows any outright evil acts that are built into the game. The best you could do is murder random people. Now I know he stalks you through various locations in the game, including Diamond City, Good Neighbor, and the Memory Den among others. But this doesn't explain why he's even following you around in the first place. He just kind of is. Because reasons. It's used as an excuse for the railroad to just trust you when they otherwise shouldn't have any reason to. This gets worse, however, if you just go straight to the church after leaving the vault. The railroad members are shocked that you're a complete unknown, and even Deacon doesn't know who you are, but he's impressed that you made it down there, and uses that as proof you can be trusted. Desdemona doesn't take it that easily, but he manages to convince her by simply saying he has a good feeling about you. They'll let you in and decode the chip for you, giving you the information you need. In fact, there's this whole song and dance of Tinker Tom trying to decode the chip and having trouble, which is just totally unnecessary. Alright, little pussy chip. 
Let's have the circuit analyzer take a crack at you. We're in. Chip accessed. Just poke the analog connectors a little. Well, the whole same what? house is gone. Oh man, don't 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 crash. Hold it together. Memory hiccup. Here it comes. Encryption algorithms. All right. Hey, don't try anything. Still running. Oh man, they've added more decimals to the last cipher. This is gonna be. Come on, baby, show me that pattern. Where is it? Wait, they're using the same logarithmic function as the key generator. You institute bastard, I got you. Soft in. Come on. Show me that sweet bass note. Come on, baby. Then we got it. We got the code. <laughs> Alternatively, you could do the smart thing and just wipe out this group of brain dead fucking ah! idiots right here and now. You could still decode the chip without them. You plug it in and it just gives you the information you need with literally no effort. Which I guess implies Tinker Tom is an incompetent idiot if he almost lost the chip trying to do it himself, when it's this simple. Once you've got the code, you return to Virgil, the biologist, who drew up technical blueprints for you. This part of the game is a little bit weird. See, you don't have access to all four factions yet, so you need to choose one of the three available to build a teleporter with, so you will then have access to all four factions, so you can pick which one you want to side with. You can pick the Minutemen, the Railroad, or... the Brotherhood of Steel. Yeah, I haven't met them yet, have I? There will be more to say on them later. In order to build a teleporter, you need to do some tasks for whichever group you decide to go with. Pressing Garvey of the Minutemen requires you to do one of his bullshit ah! Radiant quests before he'll allow you to build a teleporter in your own neighborhood that he took over. Sturges won't help you either until Preston approves it. Keep in mind, you're doing this to rescue your kidnapped child, and Preston just won't let you do it until you help him. To make matters worse, you have to accept him making you leader of the Minutemen before they'll help you at all. It doesn't appear to be optional. It might just be the ah! shitty dialogue system at play, but the result is the same. You have to accept being their leader regardless of what you actually want. You can say no, but similar to all the other times you could say no, where the game just does not progress unless you do the thing. Your character will say they already have too much to deal with, and if Nick is your companion, he'll even chime in and say you should reconsider. Bethesda is so obsessed with making you the leader of everything that the entire point of the main story up until this point, to find your babby, is sidelined so they can force this leadership role upon you if you go with the Minutemen. And to make matters worse yet, even after you do all this shit, Preston goes straight into shoving another fucking Radiant Quest in your face fucking immediately. The game itself doesn't care about its own main story as much as it cares about its utterly worthless Radiant Quests. And to make matters worse yet, after he finally agreed to let me do it, without missing a fucking beat, he went into telling me about yet another settlement that needs my goddamn help. I know people really like to meme about Preston doing this shit, but it actually is distracting and obnoxious. It's the kind of shit that makes me want to avoid him like the fucking plague he is. Let me put it this way. You save him and his group from certain death. A hopeless situation. And before he'll do anything to actually help you, he demands you help other people and forces a leadership position upon you that you may not want, all in order to get permission to build a teleporter in your own neighborhood he is squatting in, and no one else gets this treatment. You, pre-war citizen, possibly without combat experience, are supposed to take on a massive raider gang for Ten Pines Bluff, but the people of Ten Pines Bluff just get this help entirely for free. The other factions are at least more understandable in this regard, as they do have their own goals and they don't really care about you. The Minutemen's whole deal is helping people, and yet, they won't help you until you do something for them. The Railroad wants a new safe house established. They'll pick a random settlement for this, though if you haven't claimed them all yet, they'll pick an unclaimed settlement. They require some defenses to be built, and that's about it. The Brotherhood will require you to be a member of their faction, which requires meeting up with Dance and doing his quest.
Once we've got our teleporter built, we're sent inside the Institute. So this moment is what the entire main story up until this point has been leading to. First time playing, I expected to be dealing with security forces, but I found nothing but an empty room. No security alert goes out. Nothing. A man calling himself Father begins speaking over an intercom, and you enter an elevator and get to see the Institute in all its glory, presented as though it's some kind of paradise, especially compared to the rest of the world we've seen in this series. It's utterly unlike anything we've seen to date. Clean and safe, and there doesn't seem to be a worry in the world for the people living here. All the horrible things you've heard about them, everything about them kidnapping and replacing people, almost begins to feel like the paranoid ravings of the people on the surface who just don't understand or don't have all the information necessary to fully grasp the situation. Eventually you reach a room with a ten-year-old child behind a glass wall in a smaller contained room. You talk to him, and regardless of what you say, he begins to freak out, and Father enters the room and causes his child to shut down. He was a synth all along. Hi. Anyway, I started blasting. Bah! Wow. Bah! Yeah, at this point in the game, I just killed Father immediately. From my point of view, my character was desperate to find their missing child, and he just played an incredibly cruel joke by having a fake Sean put on display for you. At this point, I thought I'd have to tear apart the entire Institute until I found the real Sean, only to find all the doors locked, despite every other NPC in the facility turning hostile and trying to get to me too. I realized the only way I could go is back up the elevator to the exit. This legitimately pissed me off the first time through. After reloading a save, I talked to him instead. So I mentioned it earlier, but for the first half of the main story, you're locked to rails. Every single thing you've done in the main story up until this point is leading to this very moment. This reveal. All the inconsistencies, all the lack of options, all the poor decisions every character we've met so far, everything you're hard locked into doing for every playthrough, rescuing Nick, searching Kellogg's house, confronting and killing him, gallivanting through his memories, meeting Virgil and getting the blueprints from him, killing the Courser and building the teleporter, has all been for this exact moment. I can think of no other reason for such a horribly stupid and contrived story to exist than to preserve this god-awful twist. It's me. I am Sean. I am. Your son. I am. Your son. <sighs> what a shit twist. Shit. Yeah, this was absolutely one of the best plot twists in the <laughs> Get Fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> this old man, the leader of the Institute, is your son. You weren't refrozen for 10 years, you were refrozen for 60 years. They could have done anything here, and they did the most obvious possible fucking thing they could have. As if there wasn't enough problems with the story already, this is the exact moment it all begins to ah! crumble. Because this recontextualizes much of the story up until this point. One thing to mention right now is that he acknowledges that it's a complex situation and that he understands how emotional your character must be feeling. But this is literally seconds after he just cruelly tricked you. Another big issue is how quick your character is to accept all this. Sean explains the process, that you believe Sean was now 10, but the issue with that is that you could still reach this point entirely without your character even acknowledging it. Starting off, Kellogg is a little more than a plot device to allow this contrived bull ah! to happen. They tried to give him a backstory post-mortem, but it doesn't do anything to make him seem like there's any more depth to him in the slightest. It's a band-aid to a bullet wound. Kellogg exists purely to preserve the twist. He kidnapped your baby, yet your son is now a 60-year-old man, and Kellogg has an age today. So what gives? Well, a terminal log and a throwaway line of dialogue reveal that he was a cyborg. They extended his life long beyond that of a normal human. Yet, he shows absolutely no signs of being a cyborg prior to his death, and they slapped a couple mechanical parts into his inventory to try and act as proof of this. Cybernetics do exist within the world of Fallout, but there's always been outward signs of it. Kellogg just looks purely like a human, though. Again, to preserve the shitty twist. He also looks exactly like he did 60 years ago when he kidnapped Sean, as he does in the present day. 
In all that time, he didn't gain any new scars, nor did he lose any limbs for any reason or anything of the sort. This is so we don't think any significant amount of time has passed since the kidnapping. Like, I get that he's this badass mercenary, but it's a bit insane that in the entire span of 60 years, his appearance didn't change at all. He also didn't age a day, so these cybernetics just completely negate the aging process, which leads to other issues I'll talk about shortly. But this also makes looting his brain chunk earlier even more weird. So because there's no outward signs of cybernetics, how would your character even know that there was anything special to him that could be looted? Did Nora just randomly crack his head open like a melon? and find a mechanical part attached to his brain, and decided to keep it as a souvenir? We kind of have to assume that's the case, because that's what happens. Most players are likely to loot the brain chunk immediately after killing him, without knowing it's going to be a necessary quest item. There's no actual in-world reason to take it upon killing him. Most people do because it's a video game and we're expected to loot important quest items. The same terminal that tells us Kellogg is a cyborg, also tells us that the entire Cybernex program was halted by Sean. This is to explain why no one else has these implants besides Kellogg. He's the only one. This also helps to explain why Sean just f***ing dies for no reason later on, too. It could have been prevented, but they arbitrarily didn't do so, because reasons. The reason Sean ended the Cybernex program is because the Institute is all about preserving humanity, not some bizarre alchemation of biology and technology. Just as a quick reminder to everyone not paying attention here, this is the same group that grows fake people and vats of flesh that can be programmed and given codes to go into shutdown mode and literally have technology in them. Anyways, this terminal log reveals so much more, especially if you think about it a little more than not at all. Kellogg is over 100 years old, and he hasn't aged a day since the kidnapping 60 years ago. This implies he had the cybernetics prior to the kidnapping, meaning the program was very likely active before the kidnapping. Sean is stated to be less than a year old at the time of the kidnapping as well. So if we were to assume that Sean became the unquestioned leader of the Institute at the age of 18, and his first order of business was to shut down the program immediately, that would mean the Cybernex program was active for 19 years or more, and Kellogg is still the only person to have gotten these implants that effectively halts the aging process for him. That alone is f***ing absurd and ridiculous. These people essentially have immortality within their grasp, and no one else decided to get these implants in all the time the program was active. Now the assumption that Sean became the unquestioned leader at 18 is entirely unrealistic. This was the best case scenario. Sean himself will tell you it took him decades to become the leader of the Institute, which means this program was active for a significantly long time. His terminal log even says that the other scientists are f***ing jealous of Kellogg's dramatically increased lifespan. It's a tad bit f***ing insane that no one else ever got these implants. It's very obvious that the writers didn't consider any of these implications at all. The fact that Kellogg doesn't age due to his cybernetics is clearly just a line slapped into the game to explain why he didn't age for 60 years. Again, this was all to preserve their shitty twist. I'd also like to point out that literally none of this bullshit about cybernetics was necessary either. Quite literally, they already had something they could have used to explain why Kellogg was still alive. Without inventing this whole cybernetic nonsense that only created more and more issues for this story. They could've just made Kellogg a f***ing synth! You know, that thing the Institute is literally all about at this point and the thing they're most famous for? The original Kellogg could've been the kidnapper. He either grew old and died, or died on a job. They could've kept a copy of his memories to plug into a synth copy of himself, so the version of Kellogg you meet is merely a synth copy. Bethesda, please. Had they done it this way, it would have solved literally every problem related to the cybernetics existing. Instead of characters within the world doing something intelligent to trick the player, it's a ah! f***ing writer's doing it with their contrived horse ah! shit. You could have even gone through Kellogg's memory set piece still, even if he was a synth. There's no reason for this on any level. Hey, speaking of Kellogg's memories, that brings me to more issues. 
I said I'd be coming back to this, but the entire section of Kellogg's memories during the kidnapping is broken. Specifically, there's two major points that need discussing here. The killing of everyone frozen except the player, and Kellogg talking about the old man. Now, I already talked about how the leader of the Institute considered these people loose ends, somehow, even though they don't pose a threat to them in the slightest. But it gets even worse than that. Killing everyone else in the vault is actively detrimental to the Institute's goals, and just in general was a really f***ing stupid thing to do. So talking to Sean reveals why he was kidnapped. The Institute needed pure, untainted humans for their synthetic human program. So they decided to kidnap a pre-war vault dweller frozen in time. This line causes so many problems, it's f***ing unreal. So it kind of makes sense, we've seen in the past that pure human DNA was important to the Master's plan, and now we've seen it become important to one of the Institute's projects. So, why f***ing eliminate an entire stock of pure, pre-war, entirely untainted DNA with no expiration date? It makes no goddamn sense. They had the best possible sample of untainted human DNA and they threw it all into the f***ing garbage because of some half-baked idea that they might somehow be a threat to the literal underground society with no known surface access. Or in other words, because reasons. But sure, they only needed one person and maybe one of the parents as backup, so no big deal, right? Well, no, it is a big f***ing ah! deal. Because it stands to reason that if one of your projects required untainted human DNA, then there's the possibility that others may need it as well. Nope, just destroy all that ah. for no reason. It's pure insanity, and makes no sense on any level. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you... The Institute. The greatest minds and dumbest mother ah. in the entire series. I can't stress this enough. It makes the Institute look like a group of brain-dead idiots. And this is before we've even got to any of their other problems, which will be covered in part two of this analysis. One final note on Kellogg's memory sequence. Considering there's an entire 60 years between the two events, there are no memories shown between the kidnapping and the final section in the sequence. We get bits of his memories from the first 40 plus years of his life, then a really convenient gap of 60 years between the last two events in his memories. It's all part of preserving that awful twist. There's just absolutely no memories that survive to explore within that 60 year period. Next up is the whole old man issue. So as mentioned, there's an entire 60 year period between the kidnapping in the vault and the scene in his Diamond City home. And in both cases, he refers to the old man. In his Diamond City home, it's clear he's referring to Sean. However, he obviously can't be referring to Sean as being the old man in the kidnapping sequence. This means he's calling two different people by the same name. He even mentions how he suspects he's being used as bait for the player, the old man trying to tie up another loose end, further strengthening the connection. What makes this so weird in particular is that Kellogg is over 100 years old. Now obviously Sean physically looks older, but the point is that every living person he'd be dealing with would be younger than him by default at this point. If he called every elderly male the old man, then that's over half a century of seeing people growing old and dying that he'd be calling by this name. If we assume Kellogg is 40 at the time of the kidnapping, then a 25-year-old man in the Institute would either be about 85 or would have died by the present day. So would Kellogg just start calling this guy, the old man, when he started looking a bit older than Kellogg does? With the way human minds work, no one should be more aware than Kellogg himself that he's going to be the oldest person in any room he walks into. Regardless of his own physical appearance and the appearance of anyone else around him, he would feel that age, if not physically, then at least mentally. If anything, he'd be referring to Sean and others as young whippersnappers. Again, it's just vague bull ah! in service of preserving the twist. It's not impossible that he'd be referring to two different people by the same name, but it is definitely weird. Additionally, Kellogg having synth Sean as bait doesn't even make any ah! sense, since you would never know about it without Nick telling you and the memory sequence fully confirming it, as everyone else is too scared of the Institute to say anything. 
By the time you reach the memory sequence, you already know Sean is with the Institute from Kellogg himself. So how is Kellogg and Synth Sean supposed to be bait, when they're not even around for you to know of them being there, so they could be used as bait? In fact, why the fuck are they being used for bait weeks before the player is unfrozen from the vault? What the fuck is even the plan here? Is everyone retreaded? It seems as though Bethesda's writers had a laser focus on this dumb ah! plot twist, and they made sacrifices everywhere else in the story to achieve it. It's not surprising considering how full of himself their lead writer is. Dude thinks he's writing a song of ice and fire, when he's actually writing the Twilight Saga. That's not fair, I'm sure that putrid fucking garbage is written better than Fallout 4 is. This gets even worse, however, as if there's actually an audio log from the leader of the Institute from around the time the kidnapping happened. Now there's no date on the holotape itself, but we could figure out when it was recorded, thanks to a reference to an event in the lore that does have a date. This holotape was recorded shortly after the Broken Mask incident in 2229. Damn it, Golden, what the hell is going on down there? I have to convene an emergency directorate meeting because of this screw up. That synth was a prototype. It was absolutely not ready for field testing. The mess it caused in Diamond City threatens decades of work to keep us out of the spotlight. I will be very clear. My legacy as director will not be tarnished by your division's mistakes. I am going to find out exactly who approved any sort of operation above ground, and that person will be held fully accountable. I guess the old man didn't want so many loose ends. Oh my god, how embarrassing. Now to be fair, Sean was kidnapped in 2227. We know this because he was less than a year old at the time, he's 60 years old now, and the game takes place in 2287, meaning there's a two year gap between the kidnapping and the broken mask incident. Maybe it's possible that the old man running the Institute in 2227 had either died or stepped down by 2229. But we don't know that because it's never mentioned anywhere. There is no record of who was the leader during what periods. Considering how poorly written everything else in this game is, my assumption is that this was simply a mistake on Bethesda's part. We're also really just scratching the surface of this game too. The story is pretty much a disaster on every level, and as I mentioned earlier, this gets so much worse when you start digging into the Institute as a whole. It's truly amazing that a game that likely had a budget of around $100 million, made by a beloved and highly successful AAA studio, could have had such an abysmally written story. You'd think a little bit of effort would go into the story of a story-driven game, but I guess that can't really be expected when a talentless hack is the lead writer. A good story does not require a big budget, and a complex story, or a story with a twist, aren't inherently good, just because they're complex or have a twist. Both of these things are only good when they're well written, consistent, and make sense in the context of the world they're in, and none of this is done well in this game. A good story requires attention to detail and redrafting to fix any issues that may come up. Some brain-dead morons might think it's impossible to write a story without plot holes, but it's really not. Writing isn't a one-and-done process, Many writers spend a great deal of time trying to make sure there's as few issues as possible within their stories, that there's little to no contradictions or plot holes. This clearly wasn't the case for Bethesda. It comes across as a loose set of ideas and set pieces haphazardly slapped together with little to no care for how much sense it made or how consistent it was. The result is a broken mess of a story that contradicts itself every time it has something to say or show. Fallout 1, 2, and New Vegas aren't perfect, but they get a hell of a lot more right than they get wrong. They create interesting worlds and give reasons for why things exist the way they do. They give motivations for different characters in the world to have the goals they do. The Master isn't some guy who wants world domination for the sake of power. He genuinely sees humanity as holding themselves back due to constant conflict with one another, and he sees a super mutant master race as the only path forward. The Enclave don't want to exterminate the Empire because they think it's fun, 
but because they genuinely believe the mutants to be dangerous to the future of mankind. Caesar isn't conquering tribes for the sake of it, he believes what he's doing is best to keep humanity going. Each of these groups are wrong and do horrible things, but they're well thought out and have believable goals. They're not simplistic cartoon villains like the Institute is. Hell, thought was even put into the specifics of how the FEV worked in Fallout 1. They could have just as easily said it was a green goo made by science that turns people into super mutants and left it at that. But they took the time to detail out how and why it was made and the effects it has. Nothing Bethesda has written for the series even approaches the quality of writing that Fallout 1, 2, and New Vegas have. On top of that, these games were largely about choice. Your choices had consequences for the world and characters within that world. Necropolis dying out, the conflict between the humans and super mutants of Broken Hills, the various factions in New Vegas. Your choices have led to different outcomes. Fallout 3 stripped this back near to the point of not existing at all, and Fallout 4 stripped it back even further. We are halfway through the main story, and we've only now, just now, gotten a significant choice, and that's on which faction to side with for the rest of the game. By the way, if anyone thinks I'm being unfair in my criticism, a few years ago the lead writer of Fallout 4, M.L. Pagliarillo, did a speech in which he attempted to justify his ah! writing without outright admitting that it's garbage. Essentially, he assumes that because people are going to be spending 30 hours building shacks, that they're not going to pay attention to the story, no matter how well written it is. Or as he describes it, you write the great American novel, and they rip out the pages and make paper airplanes with them. Apparently ML doesn't realize that just because there's side features that players may sink a lot of time into, that doesn't mean the story is going to be entirely disregarded, nor does it mean no effort has to be put into it. These aren't excuses for writing dog ah! shit. Many players do care about the story, especially longtime fans, and hell, even if someone does spend 30 hours building shacks, even if someone spends 900 hours building shacks, even if someone spends 10,000 hours building shacks, they may still want to engage with the story content the game has to offer. So why give them garbage? I think it's pretty clear that ML is simply a classic example of someone being promoted past their ability. People are quick to mention that he's behind the Dark Brotherhood in Oblivion, widely regarded as the best faction in the entire game, but what most people seem to miss, including ML himself, is that the actual story for the Dark Brotherhood was actually pretty simplistic, and even then it has issues. The Dark Brotherhood was so fondly remembered, primarily because they made the assassination quests interesting by adding all the bonus objectives and coming up with unique scenarios, and the questline was more engaging for many players as a result. This is a man who describes his own writing for Skyrim as the most biblical story they've ever done, when the story from Morrowind was literally about the reincarnation of a demigod that people worshipped. Not to mention, Skyrim's story is actually pretty fucking garbage too. Honestly, his whole rant about people building shacks just comes across as someone bitter that their garbo ah! writing was trashed by anyone who paid attention to it, and people realized the only thing of value in Fallout 4 was mindlessly shooting enemies and building shit. Because the true mark of being a, a, tr a, of a real developer is, as every developer knows, is waiting for the reviews to come in, right? And then reading the reviews, of course, and hopefully, if you get lucky, ignoring the reviews, right? <laughs> Anyways, returning to Sean, he says that he wants you to find the Institute so he can meet you. Why not just bring you here? They have f***ing teleporters! Why would he risk the life of his only surviving parent by throwing them into the wasteland totally unprepared? Hell, he even says that the player killing Kellogg was part of his goal, to give them both some level of closure for your spouse. But you know what would put a real quick end to his goal of meeting his remaining parent? If they maybe didn't come out on top when going up against an extremely effective and skilled professional killer cyborg that has about a hundred years of experience. In fact, knowing this retroactively turns everything that's happened up until this point into a massive ah! f***ing contrivance. Let's go over all the most important beats in the story one by one, then break them down. You exit the vault and talk with Codsworth, 
who eventually suggests going to Concord. After rescuing Preston's group, you're told about Diamond City. Once there, you learn of a detective who can help you, so you go rescue him. After talking with him, you search the house of a suspect. Having found a clue, a dog leads you to his hideout. You confront and kill Kellogg. With no real lead, Nick suggests taking a piece of Kellogg's brain to look through his memories. Having done so, you learn of an escaped scientist who may be able to help you. You kill a courser for his chip. You get the railroad to decode it. You get the technical blueprints from the biologist. You build a teleporter to enter the Institute. Pretty much every step here becomes contrived as fuck when the intention is for you to reach a location that no one else has ever found. I really have to stress this. Sean expects someone from before the war to complete the impossible, and they just so happen to do it through an extreme series of coincidences. Even before this point, it was a bit of a stretch as to just how lucky the sole survivor is with their ability to always find the next lead. In particular, having a tracking dog, Kellogg's brain chunk being intact enough to get a clue, and Virgil existing as he does. But it becomes exponentially worse due to the fact that almost every single factor at play, from the time you leave the vault to the time you reach the Institute, is completely out of Sean's control. He didn't set up the trail of breadcrumbs for you to find to reach him. In fact, it seems as though he has no actual plan for you to reach the Institute, and just wanted to see if you could purely on your own. So first and foremost, before we even get to any of those points, the main issue would simply be surviving in this world. We see time and time and time again that people apparently struggle to get by in their day to day. Food, water, radiation, not to mention dealing with active threats such as raiders, ghouls, deathclaws, or, you know, synths. But now let's look at how insanely contrived all this bullshit is. First of all, Codsworth is the weakest point here. Ultimately, if he were destroyed or gone for whatever reason, it's reasonable to assume that Nora would just head into Concord, being the only main road out of town. Next, we meet Preston's crew. Again, this isn't the biggest of deals. If we totally ignore hostile threats and assume Nora survives such encounters, then it's reasonable that someone would eventually direct her to Diamond City if Preston's group wasn't here. However, it is a bit of a coincidence that she just happens to run into a psychic who tells her for a fact her son is alive and well. After that is Nick, who is important for a few steps here. Most of the people in Diamond City don't like to get involved in anyone else's troubles, and some are even scared to answer your questions about your missing child. Regardless, no one seems to know Kellogg, but luckily for us, Nick happens to have been keeping tabs on him for some reason. Without Nick, we might not have ever known about Kellogg's house. Inside the house, we find he left behind something that could be tracked by a dog. It's the only piece of notable garbage in his house. So again, that's a bit lucky. But you know what else is lucky? That we just so happen to have a dog that knows how to track someone down, and I guess it's also lucky that Kellogg just so happens to have left a bunch of additional clues along the way that didn't get destroyed or spoiled in the weeks since he made this journey. It's also super lucky that this pre-war human manages to survive against an army of synths known to wipe towns off the map, and as mentioned, it's also super duper lucky this pre-war human manages to face off against a professional killer cyborg with a century of experience and comes out on top. It's also lucky that when you killed him, you didn't damage the necessary part of his brain to go into his memories, and it's additionally lucky Nick was even willing to help us with this, and that he was available at all. Remember, he was being held prisoner by mobsters, it would have been a real shame if they had decided to kill him, or even if they had done so accidentally. It's also lucky that Institute Tech has been wandering about the surface for years and years, and not once did they think to destroy or recapture him for any reason, when they have an entire division of their operations devoted to capturing escaped synths. And they have a spy in the city in the form of the mayor, who is a synth. And if you join the railroad, you learn of a group of raiders who specifically target synths. Not sure how they do that since it's impossible to tell in the human-like synths, but they also apparently decided to never target Nick. 
it's additionally lucky that Kellogg's memories were intact enough to give you a clue on where to look next. Now we meet Virgil, human turned super mutant. Boy oh boy are there so many conveniences here. First of all, it's lucky that he's even out here in the first place for numerous reasons. He managed to retain his intelligence and sanity when turning into a super mutant, which just to remind everyone, is extremely f***ing rare for tainted humans, which Virgil certainly is, because the entire reason the Institute kidnapped Sean in the first place is because of a lack of pure humans being available. Meaning they had none of their own in the first place, and the best option was Vault 111. A tainted human retaining full intelligence, sanity, and memory is so rare to the point that Virgil is literally the only example of this ever happening in the entire series. Even the companion, Strong, is still a regular super mutant. He just liked the idea of traveling with a human. Virgil also managed to escape the Institute alive. The Corsairs and Kellogg haven't managed to kill him yet. Hell, the Deathclaw sleeping right outside his cave doesn't even seem to be bothered by him. He's also totally willing to help you, too. Sure, he wants his cure, but just look at the forces you're going up against. You manage to not only track down a Corsair, which a game goes out of its way to establish as an extremely brutal and efficient killing machine, but you manage to kill it too, Corsair chip intact. Next up, you not only manage to track down the Railroad, which the Institute has attempted to wipe out previously and has failed in, but they're willing to help you too. A biologist happens to have memorized the exact blueprints for a highly advanced teleporter based entirely off of things he's seen and heard, which implies that most of this is just guesswork, and drew them up for you, without any error. The teleporter itself works perfectly fine and doesn't lead to any horrible outcomes. Finally, you just so happen to have the skill to build this teleporter and find all the necessary parts for it. It's like the stars f***ing ah! aligned to get you in here. Aside from Codsworth and Preston's group, if a single one of these situations didn't play out perfectly the way they do, you'd be fucked out of luck, and getting inside the Institute would be impossible. And just to remind everyone, this is exactly what Sean wanted. He wanted to meet his parent, and most of these aspects required for you to reach him are entirely out of his control. If Nick was killed for any reason, there goes your lead to Kellogg's house. But worse than that, Nick can't help you get through Kellogg's memories if he's dead. If you didn't have a dog, you wouldn't have been able to track Kellogg down at all. There are no other leads, you absolutely need the dog. That's why the game forces it on you. Kellogg even acknowledges that he's being used as bait, and Sean confirms he intended for you to face Kellogg so they could have a bit of revenge, but then he had Kellogg sent away from Diamond City and left no clues or leads to allow you to find him if you didn't have the f***ing ah! dog. Did Sean plan for you to have a tracking dog? Did he know you'd meet one? Is dog meat actually an Institute synth working towards Sean's goal? What would the alternative have been if dog meat didn't exist? Fort Hagen was full of synths. How did Sean know you'd be able to take them all on? Especially if you really are playing as Nora, who has no known combat training. Why did he think you'd be able to take on 20 synths? Worse than that, why did he think you'd be able to kill Kellogg? If we're speaking realistically here, it seems like you were set up for failure, more than Kellogg being set up to be killed for the sake of closure. So with Kellogg dead, how are we supposed to find the Institute? There are literally no other leads. Did Sean expect you to crack his head open like a melon to take a brain sample, and go looking through his memories? Did he even know it was possible? What if the tech keeping the brain intact was destroyed during the fight? What if entering his memories was impossible? What would you do then? What if entering someone else's memories like this fried your own brain and either killed you or made you a vegetable? It's a good thing Amari agreed to do this horribly immoral act. Kellogg's memories are extremely spotty and broken up. What if he didn't retain the one single memory we need to progress? How would you know where to go next? You're at a complete dead end yet again. How about Virgil? Did Sean plan for him to turn himself into a super mutant and go rogue? Did he know Virgil would retain his intelligence and sanity? If so, how? Then why order him to be killed? 
What if Nora got busy throwing paper airplanes for 30 hours, and in that time, Kellogg and the Sense tracked Virgil down and killed him? What if you died to the Courser, which just took out a building full of people who are very likely to be more well-trained for combat than you are? What if Virgil, the biologist, didn't have the blueprints memorized? How would you get into the Institute then? What are the alternatives? How did Sean expect you to find and enter the Institute if for some reason Virgil died or didn't have the blueprints? What if you were incompetent at building the teleporter and accidentally got some wires crossed or got some resistors that were too strong or too weak, resulting in the teleporter simply not working or turning you into an abomination of flesh that dies? Starfleet, do you have them? Enterprise. What we got back didn't live long, fortunately. I've got to stress this point, but no one has ever found the Institute, and Sean just expects this inexperienced pre-war person to just do it. And the only reason it's even possible is through a massive series of insane contrivances because the writers are shit. Hell, no one even knew that they fucking used teleporters up until this point. That's how well kept their secrets were, and all the necessary information and resources just so happen to be available to you when you need them all at the exact same time in order to do this otherwise impossible task. Now this is a video game, so of course everything works out, or you reload a save I guess, but in the narrative, these are supposed to be real people, and this is the real world that they live in. No amount of, I'm gonna save you, son, is gonna keep someone alive with a bullet to their brain. Sean just releases someone totally inexperienced with the wasteland and expects them to not only conquer it, but to achieve something no one ever has before. It's pure insanity. After playing an incredibly cruel trick on you and showing up in the flesh, why did Sean expect anything else besides meeting a shower of bullets immediately? This is the point in the game where you choose which faction you want to side with. Or, more accurately, this is the point where you decide if you want to side with the Institute or not. If you decide not to join them, they will essentially declare war on you once you leave. Once outside, you've got the option of picking any of the three remaining factions you've dealt with. The Minutemen, the Railroad, and the Brotherhood of Steel. But this is where I'm going to end part one. In part two, I'll cover each of the four factions in far more depth, because trust me, we've only just scratched the surface of the issues this game has. Thank you for watching.